Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I want to show you a couple applications of Van Kampen's theorem. If you don't remember what Van Kampen's theorem states, here it is. Uh, so you could pause the video and read that over. Otherwise, let's get straight to the applications. So the first thing I want to do is show you how Van Kampen's theorem behaves under an operation called the wedge sum. So here's the definition. So let x1 together with little x1 all the way up to xn with little xn be a collection of pointed spaces. Then the wedge sum denoted like this is the space, so it's a quotient space of the disjoint union. So I take the disjoint union as i goes from 1 to n of the xi. And then I mod out by little x1 is related to little x2 is related to all the way up to little xn. So this makes a lot more sense visually. Visually, if I have like a space, uh, here's x1 and Here's x2, and I want to know their wedge sum. I just glue the two points together. So here is my space, x1 wedge x2. So in many practical cases, like ones that one will encounter when doing higher level mathematics. Points have a neighborhood which deformation retracts onto them. So this is, for example, the case, if you've seen them before, in manifolds. Uh, it is also the case in finite CW complexes. So this is a situation that is ripe for application of Van Kampen's theorem. So this makes for an easy Van Kampen's theorem, VKT. Uh, so Van Kampen's theorem, I need to choose two open sets and their intersection needs to be path connected. So for example, in my previous case, uh, so in this space, I can take A to be the circle plus a little bit of this disk. So note that this is an open set. I'm, I'm not exactly including the boundary here. I'll just dot everything. That's an open disk in the sphere and it's the whole space of the circle, and so it's open in the quotient space. And note that this is homotopy equivalent, like I can just contract that disk down onto that point. So it's homotopy equivalent to just the circle, and I'll do a symmetric thing on the other side in B. I'll take the whole sphere and just a little bit of that circle. I'm not including the endpoints here so that it's an open set, and this will retract onto the sphere. And the last thing I care about is the intersection, A intersect B, and so what I get here is everything that's contained in both, so it's like the open interval as a subset of the circle and the open disk as a subset of the sphere, 
And this is just contractible. All I do is do the contraction on the left, squish that down there. And I do the contraction on the right, squish everything down here. And this has the homotopy type of a point. So by Van Kampen's theorem, pi one of the space here is pi one of a free product pi one of b modulo this normalizer of the inclusion of all of the elements in pi one of a intersect b. So I'll just remind you of that. Normalizer of inclusion of like on both sides of pi one of a intersect b. But the important thing here is that the intersection is contractible and so it has no fundamental group. And so this is Z free product with the trivial group amalgamated over the trivial subgroup. And this is isomorphic to just the integers. And that's pretty intuitive here. You have the circle on the left and that's going to contain some loops, an integer's worth of loops, and you have the sphere on the right, and that's not going to contribute anything. Let's just write this out in a formal proposition that deals with uh, the general case. So let x1, little x1, up to xn, little xn, be a collection of pointed spaces. So you can try to guess at what the theorem is going to be. So let's suppose each xi has a neighborhood which deformation retracts onto it. Then the fundamental group of the wedge from i goes from 1 to n of xi is just a free product as i goes from 1 to n of the fundamental group of xi. I'm implicitly taking the base point to be the chosen base point of the pointed space. Let's prove this. And really, this is just a generalization of the picture that we previously drew. So let xi, little xi, be an element of ui, which is a subset of big xi, be the neighborhood of little xi, which retracts onto it. Now, I'm going to choose my sets in Van Kampen's theorem as follows. So let AI be equal to XI together with the union as uh, J over, over all J not equal to I of UJ. So what am I doing? I'm taking the entire space XI, one of the wedge sum ends, and then I'm gluing together all of the little contractible neighborhoods in all of the other sets. So note that AI is open in the wedge sum I goes from 1 to n of XI. Now, the next thing we need is that all of the intersections are path connected. AI intersect AJ. Well, 
let me just sort of draw a picture here. Or rather, let me just scroll up to the previous picture. This is essentially what we're looking at here. We're looking at uh, the neighborhoods of each of the points. Since AI was the whole space on the left and a, a little bit of that other neighborhood, and BI was the whole space on the right and a little with the other neighborhood, the thing that's in both of them is the little neighborhoods wedged together. So AI intersect AJ is UI uh, wedged with UJ, which is homotopy equivalent to a point. Again, I just do the contraction on UI first, and then I do the contraction of UJ second, and that is a contraction of UI wedge UJ onto this point. In particular, it's path connected. So N has no pi one. Okay, so uh, by Van Kampen's theorem, pi one of xi, this is a bunch of open sets, their intersection is path connected, so I can use this. It's pi one of a one free producted with pi one of a two all the way up to pi one of a n modded out by this n but again this is generated by fundamental group elements in the intersections the intersections are trivial so that's trivial our next goal is what is the fundamental group of ai now since ai uh, well, AI is XI together with all these contractible neighborhoods. So I can just do all of the contractions and contract AI down onto this XI here. Oops. So I meant, um, I'm trying to calculate the fundamental group of the wedge of these XIs. So since each AI is homotopy equivalent to XI, we get that the fundamental group of the wedge as I goes from one to N of XI is the fundamental group, what used to be AI, now XI, X1, reproducted with pi one of X2, all the way up to pi one of XN, like we said. Great. So under reasonable circumstances, wedge sums just result in free products. It's as easy as it could be. Here's a nice little corollary. Pi one of a wedge of n circles and circles is isomorphic to the free group on n generators. You just do the wedge sum of n copies of a circle. So the main spaces we've been talking about throughout this class have been CW complexes and what we're going to do now is a very general way for calculating the fundamental group of any finite CW complex. This will work for infinite CW complexes too, but I'm going to restrict the finite to make my statements a little easier. So fundamental group of CW complexes. So, the first thing we're going to show is that this is like step one. We will show that attaching an N cell 
for n greater than or equal to 3 does nothing to the fundamental group. And now let me state this precisely. Here's our proposition. So let x be a just any path connected space. And let s n minus 1 be on the boundary of dn for n greater than or equal to 3. Also, let's let f from s n minus 1 to x be a map. And our last object, let x prime be equal to what we usually do. I'm going to glue dn to x along this map f. And the claim is that pi 1 of x prime is equal to pi 1 of x. So the way to read this is attaching a 3 cell or higher does not change the fundamental group. And we're going to use Van Kampen's theorem for this as well. So let x, or yeah, let me not declare everything again. So take a and b in x as follows. a is going to be x together with the points in dn so that the size of y is greater than one third. So that is, it's a, I'll just draw this uh, in, in D2. Remember we're working on, in higher disks, but uh, I, it's harder to draw the higher dimensional ones. So this is like all of the stuff out here. And let B just be the points in DN so that Y is less than two thirds. So this is like the inner part of the disk. This is X, you need all that. And B it's going to be the stuff on the outside together, like all the way under the inside. All right. First thing to check, are these sets open? Yes, because, uh, yeah, these should be dotted lines. And the, the blue line should be dotted too. I declared them with less thans, not less than or equal to's. So we're good there. Next thing to check what does A intersect B? Well, in the picture, it's this strip here between two thirds and one third. And that's an open path connected set. Great. Now, A is, so let me draw another picture of A a little more schematically. This is X here. And what I did was glued on a copy of SN minus one cross I. Here's the SN minus one on the outside cross I. And this can shrink down. So this is homotopy equivalent to X. B is homotopy equivalent to DN. It's just like a smaller open ball. 
And A intersect B is homotopy equivalent to S n minus 1. And now we have everything we need for Van Kampen's theorem. So pi 1 of x prime is pi 1 of A, free producted with pi 1 of B, modulo n. And now, since S n minus 1 is simply connected, we proved that last class, for uh, n greater than or equal to 3, we have pi 1 of x prime is, okay, so pi 1 of a is pi 1 of x. Pi 1 of b is trivial because b is contractible, and that normal subgroup doesn't exist, and, and there we have it. So that's how gluing a three cell or four cell or five cell works. So now we've learned everything interesting happens within the one and the two cells. And that's step two. What happens when we attach two cells? So first of all, let's start off with a fact that is an exercise, which we've mostly done based on the wedge of circles, but a little more work needs to be done. It says that pi 1 of the 1 skeleton, so remember, 1 skeleton of a CW complex is equal to the free group on and generators. And also, let's call that fact one. Here's fact two, which we've also proved. If XF is the space X union F along with Y, and xg is x union g y, then if f and g are homotopic maps, xf is homotopy equivalent to xg. Now let's remember how we attach a two cell we're going to take D2 and glue its boundary, S1, to the 1 skeleton, which has free fundamental group. So since a 2 cell is obtained by attaching uh, D2 to X1 by a map up to homotopy, on S1, well, what are homotopy classes of S1 maps? They're fundamental group elements. Roughly, if we have a base point, so that means that uh, the attaching map is determined by an element of the fundamental group of x1, which is the free group. Here's a couple examples. Just two quick examples so we know we have a grip on this. So let G be equal to just 
a single zero cell and a single one cell. Then if F from S1 to S1 takes one in the fundamental group of S1 to one in the fundamental group of S1. So this one is the input and this is the target. Then uh, G union a two cell along F is simply the disk. So that's not very interesting. Here is something we'll prove next time. Let G be this same just circle. Now if uh, H from S1 to S1 has that, I'm gonna say the same thing I said before, just in different language. Uh, the induced map on the fundamental group of the element one is two, then G union along H, a two cell, is the space RP2. Now the big question, what happens when I attach a two cell to a graph? And here it is. So let G be a connected graph, a la the one skeleton of a finite CW complex. And let E2 be a two cell Let me just get a basis for the fundamental group of G. Pi one of G be this free group in particular, A1, A2, up to AN, with no relations. And let F from S1 to G be the map where the induced map on fundamental groups, so pi one of S1 to this. So pi one of S1 is a cyclic group. So the whole map is determined by where it sends one. Let's suppose it sends one to just some word W. Then the fundamental group of G union along F, this two cell, is my same generators, A1, A2, to AN, and now I have a new relation, which is just that word. Let's prove it. As you can imagine, this is gonna be Van Kampen's theorem again. So, uh, let this two cell just be given with coordinates like before. It's the points in R2 so that the modulus of Y is less than or equal to 1. And let A be the graph together with the points in D2 so that Y is greater than a third. And let B be just the points in D2 so that Y is less than two thirds. So as before, uh, A is homotopic to just G. Again, that S1 cross I is just gonna shrink down. B is homotopic to D2. That's fairly straightforward to see. And A intersect B is homotopic now to S1 cross I, which, so, so it's actually homeomorphic to S1 cross I, which is homotopic to S1. So in particular, the intersection is path connected. So I can run Van Kampen's theorem on it. And when I run Van Kampen's theorem, I need to know 
how the fundamental group of the intersection includes into each piece. So let me just draw a little sketch here. I have my graph G, and then there's going to be a disk, and this disk is going to map down by a word W on the boundary. What's A? A is like everything up to here. And B is sort of everything down to here. It's going to draw it solid, even though it's an open set. And now there's this S1 cross I in there. And here is the generator that I care about. So I want to know, it's called this C. I A B of C and I B A of C. Now, on one hand, so remember I A B, this goes into A, and I B A goes into B. So, what is the inclusion of C into B? Well, you can see that you can just shrink it to the top cap there. I, B, A of C is the identity. Now, on the other hand, well, let's just write this down since it shrinks to the top. On the other hand, what is I, A, B of C? Well, the fundamental group of A is, is the fundamental group of this graph. And the circle just drops down onto the boundary. And that boundary is glued to the graph along some word ah, uh, W. And so I, A, B of C is W. So pi 1 of... G union along F, this two cell. So I need the generators from both the fundamental group of A and the fundamental group of B. There's no generators coming from B. So it's just A1 to uh, AN. And now the only relation I have is that this word w is trivial on one side it's the graph word and on the other side it's the disk and that's all there is to it so by induction let's just have a corollary uh let x be a connected two-dimensional CW complex. And suppose that pi one of the one skeleton is the free group on N generators. And suppose X is built with K two cells attached along W1 to WK, then the fundamental group of the CW complex is given by generators G1 to GN and relations W1 to WK. So here's a definition. A group is finitely presented if, it's a pretty obvious definition, but it has a presentation 
with a finite number of generators and relations. So here's a nice little corollary of our theorem. Every finitely presented group is pi one of x for some two dimensional CW complex x. So that's going to do it for today. I want to mention that this last corollary here is the start of a study of what's called finiteness properties of groups, which is an active area of research still happening today. It's a very nice theorem. It tells you essentially that if you want to study a finitely presented group, you could instead build the CW complex and study that as a space. And it turns out to be surprisingly useful. Next time, we'll apply our knowledge about fundamental groups of two-dimensional CW complexes to a special class of CW complexes called surfaces. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.